Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from true, exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today, not from a van, from Alessio. <laughs> Hello, not from a van. My, my van days are passed behind me. Uh, and I will be your host, Alexis, because today is a special Duo Games episode. Uh, we'll be talking about Pixel Tactics, a tiny game inspired by Final Fantasy Tactics, and... Um, oops, I forgot to... Sky, Sky T, T. Sky Team. Exactly. Yes! I forgot to put on my notes for that. Um, yeah, no worries. This will be a mess. Uh, but, before, but before that, uh, we should start with the Standy Catch-Up. So how have you been doing, Alessio? Oh, fine, thank you. So uh, this will be a very weird episode. So it's a two-people recording. Yoo-hoo! Uh, I, I, I really hope that in the post-production we will add the tango music here. <laughs> it takes two to tango. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm doing pretty fine. Uh, the, the, the cool news uh, from around here are basically that we had some cold, finally, because uh, you might know or not know that in all of Europe there, there, there has been a lot of freezing temperature. Oh, we were the... snowed in yeah. here. Yeah, but not here. <laughs> here. Here in Italy, we got 13 degrees basically all the time. So this is basically the first days so we are getting below zero. And uh, it's refreshing to see that we can get cold too. So that's good news, I guess. For <laughs> Let's take it uh, as good as it gets, at least. And... Uh, uh, Besides that, uh, I've been playing a lot of two-player two games, uh, actually, this time. Uh, fun fact, I, I was curious about... I, I was uh, uh, undecided if whether to bring uh, Sky Team or uh, uh, something like District Noir or something. But in the end, I think Sky Team is the better game, so that's why I will be bringing it now. That said... I'm basically going crazy with the uh, Invincible the comic. Because, <laughs> yeah, I, it is a I, pretty good comics. Yeah, yeah. I, I basically skipped it when it first came out, but I got a bit hooked on the Amazon Prime uh, show, so I just decided to. Yeah, it's. Uh, I I read the comics uh, before the the show came out, and it's very fun. To yeah. see how different the start of the show is with where it goes than the comics without yeah. spoiling anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, the, the fun thing uh, I found that it started as uh, as a stab thrown at basically the Justice League, but all uh, superhero tropes, and that it, it got better over time. So, yeah. so that, that's beautiful. I am addicted. I think I, I I have a few days ahead to to keep to, to, to get uh, actually to the end of this production. So that's basically it. So what about you, Alexis? Uh, on my end, I've been a little bit sick, but be, uh, behind that, uh, I've been I've been doing quite well. Uh, I recently went to see Audrey to uh, play more of the Gamblers uh, campaign from Kingdom Death. Ooh, we... where did you get? Uh, we just uh, fought our first king. Oh, um, <laughs> that's a beautiful fight. Yeah, it it is a it is a fun fight, but it's a very convoluted one. Uh, I don't <laughs> think that's the strongest one of the um, uh, of the gambler's chest so far. But I'm very much looking forward to going to her next time because oh, it gets worse. We are going to do the. I think that's. My next visit will get to year 25 or something, and then the, mm -hmm. the next one will finally finish the campaign. Uh, so far, it's been, a, it's been a pretty fun campaign, I think stronger than Cole. Uh, and I especially loved the Gambler's fight. I think that might be one of the uh, most fun showdown that Adam designed, at least against a, a Nemesis or like a, a big non showdown monster uh, that one has been that one has been quite good 
Yeah, uh, th there has been a lot of controversy about whether the gambler's fight is cool or not, but I, I like it. I like it. I think that I cannot stand more than one of these fights in a campaign, but one is pretty fine, actually. Yeah, I mean, it, it is supposed to be the big fight of the of the campaign, so it is it is okay if it's a bit different, if it's a bit more of its own thing. Uh, I yeah. personally really enjoyed it. Yeah, um, it has its own grandeur. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, that aside, not too much to uh, to talk about. So I guess that we can jump into our games. Uh, oh, because this will be short. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I really wanted to talk about Doom Mansion, but before we, but because we couldn't get more than two people, we decided to record <laughs> a special two-player episode. Oh um, yeah, yeah. So both games that we are going to talk today are very well suited for two two players, uh, and I would say that both are both are equally great games to buy if you often play with one partner. Uh, do you want to start, Alessio? Should I? Ah, of course. So, uh, since we are two recording, this is a two-player games uh, episode. Uh, we will bring, bring in two games, because two is our number today. And we will start with Sky Team, a 2023 uh, game by... I think the first publisher was Scorpion Masque, but uh, since we are European, that's all we, uh, we know about it. It, it debuted at Essen, it got the spotlight at the show, it's uh, a game from Luc Raymond, so it's uh, like uh, Meeple Circus. Uh, it's one of those games where a, a French author takes uh, a lot of concepts, mixes them together and makes something excellent. So, um, in Sky Team, you are basically uh, a crew of two... It's a cooperative game where uh, you are pilot and co-pilot of a plane and you are, try to, uh, you are trying to make the plane land safely. So le uh, let's put aside the shenanigans like on our plane with <laughs> Leslie Nielsen, but uh, uh, the game is basically a cooperative game when two players are uh, rolling four dice each turn and uh, they must allocate these dice on a cockpit trying to set up landing gear, to keeping the plane aligned, uh, decelerating and trying to not overshoot the airport. Because, uh, and I'll be quoting a, mo a much more popular uh, episode from No Pun Included, so <laughs> yeah, advertisement, but yeah, we, have, we have no rules. This is Far West, so whatever. You crash and lose. <laughs> I, I liked a lot that video. So uh, that that was a good video. Yeah. Yeah, to, that, that's free advertisement. Uh, any, anyway, uh, this game is basically uh, a lot of bad stuff that could happen while you try to uh, land the plane. You basically have every turn to roll four dice, and you don't know what your uh, companion, your co-pilot, uh, rolled. So basically you are trying to throw the dice blind and you are trying to do uh, to fulfill of the operation. There are two main mechanics that are always necessary to do and they are the setting up the plane speed and try to balance the plane. Now, uh, how do you do that? Well, uh, you play one dice on balance, for instance, with a value number and then the other player plays another dice of, the, of theirs in the other spot for uh, balance. That way you get a difference between the two, the, the two values. If the plane is, if the difference is zero, the plane stands like this, like that. Otherwise it tilts a little towards the direction with the positive difference and by a number of positions like uh, uh, equal to the difference. So, for instance, if you rolled a four, and your opponent and your co-pilot co to the to your right uh, put a, a five on that, uh, it will be five minus four one. The plane would tilt a little one position to the right. You have three position to the right and three position to the left. 
if you get three position unbalanced towards a direction, uh, the plane crashes. But if you get to the airport and the plane is uh, the plane is not perfectly aligned horizontally, you crash again. So that's basically it. The other part is decelerating. You uh, basically get to uh, you, you are losing eight uh, all the time and you are trying to get to the airport at zero eight. You cannot get, uh, be, you not get to land before the airport, you cannot get to land past the airport. And that's the other part. You set the speed, the engines, every turn by setting a die each on a precise spot. In that spot, the sum of the dice is your speed value. You have a bracket uh, behind which you can you can have if you uh, you have a bracket made by a blue uh, pointer and the orange pointer representing your colors, and uh, it is set between numbers. For instance, you have numbers one, two to twelve, and you have the initial bracket on fa between four and five and eight and nine, meaning that. If you score less than four b before the first bracket, uh, you don't move at all, you don't lose quota. But if you move between the two brackets, you basically descend by one position, by 1000 feet, and you slowly begin to descend. If you go past the rightmost bracket, you descend drastically two positions. So basically you begin crashing on going downward immensely with, with immense speed and going down. And that's basically it. There is a lot of other stuff that you need to do. For instance, you have to uh, shoot planes out of the air because of course there's airplane traffic. So you need to use the radio action. Sometimes you put a die on the radio action and you are shooting a plane outside at the distance uh, the, the indicated by the value on the die. When you're uh, using the radio action, you're not shooting other planes out. You are yeah, you to are move actually, out of the way. Yeah, of course, it's shooting out of there. I think the manual says shooting out, but it's. Uh, I prefer it that way. So, if you don't mind, you are shooting planes out of the air and uh, you are trying to remove everything from your visual because you are trying to crash land this thing. So, hopefully, a real plane doesn't, doesn't land like this because this is dramatic. Now, uh, the, the, the test uh, game may... Oh, okay, there's also the final turn when there's, uh, you have must deploy the, all your flaps and your landing gear and everything and you must go at a tolerable speed. After that, you must hope that you uh, are getting to a speed which is lower than your brake value. Uh, all this time you have been accumulating dice on the brake value, which is basically a number going two to six. The last turn you need to stop the plane, so you have to roll lower than the brake value so that you can safely land. So basically at the end of all of this, you know why people claps when an airplane lands. <laughs> because this is so... Actually, uh, it's... Uh, I think that you can say, because that's actually on the box, that it's a two-player co-op immersive eye drama. So there's a lot of drama within the rules. But this is just getting to the Montreal airport, which is uh, every, every, plane, ev every plane worker knows that that's the easiest airplane there is. Uh, have you tried to, fa to, 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 to land in Taiwan, for instance? Or uh, basically... Uh, there are a lot of mods which are the, the, the very important part because I, I played this with uh, three partners so far, this game, and everyone was capable of landing to Montreal Airport. So it was actually reasonably easy uh, to, to make the plane land with all the mechanics and rules that you get. That's why this is an introduction. You actually have a lot of modules and other rules, for instance, for wind gusts or for training the intern. I, I don't know why if you don't fully train the intern before you land, you crash. 
So <laughs> I actually don't know how this airplane works. Hopefully this is not what our brave people in the air are doing every day for us because it's a miracle that we are all alive now. You also <laughs> but, have to make coffee in, middle yeah, of the, in the middle of the air. Yeah, making coffee is very important because you make a coffee, you get a plus one or minus one uh, to a die roll. So, you know, you, you have that. But... Uh, I, I know that this game uh, is easy to joke about because the theme is both tense and dramatic and fun. You are basically... Uh, the beautiful thing is that before each round you have a small briefing like let's try to let's try to shoot those airplane out, out of the sky, let's try to land gracefully, please, please go slow, <laughs> or let's try to balance this thing, it's being dramatic, everything is tilted uh, 45 degrees. So uh, you are trying to do all of this, you roll the dice, and when, when stuff go to heck, and something it goes, uh, sometimes it goes, you basically are getting uh, the worst of everything you you are seeing like okay I, I will put a two on the engines so that we'll possibly go very slow or don't move at all and uh, your copilot throws a five because they tried to signal you before that they have a five but you didn't understand that <laughs> so uh, it's beautiful because uh, there is a way to get uh, uh, to get a lot of drama out of it and a way to get better because uh, all mistakes you make uh, you will do once and i think uh, that the game is made perfectly to to make you play two or three games uh, in a row with different modules to to experience everything uh, it's very fun now it's beautiful the, the beautiful part is because the mechanics perfectly support this. I mean, rolling dice would be considered usually, okay, we are completely in the mode of randomness, but basically everything is playable, except maybe someone rolling four ones and the other player rolling four six. But besides that, you have a perfect action economy, which is tight at the right point. And that is both the strongest suit of this game and my main compliant. Uh, why? Uh, because the, the, the action economy is perfect. I mean, you have just the right number of actions to complete uh, your action. Uh, depending on the sets of mod, the subset of modules that you decide to use to land in the specific airport, you have an action economy where you could waste one or two action and no more. And when you waste, it means that you make coffee or uh, actually, yeah, you just try to make coffee because that's uh, all the spare dice uh, uh, that you will use. You can uh, do a crappy radio action, but it is useless and usually frowned upon. So you want. The problem is that uh, since you can solve each module every time and you are quick to learn the the game eventually solves solves itself so uh, it's beautiful as long as you have new stuff to try new modules a new combination of stuff but i i, I while well, i find it always fun and compelling to play with a new partner i don't find the challenge anymore with someone uh, i already beat every module with so that's basically it. It's a very fun game. It's actually uh, at the right price. Maybe it's, it is still a bit uh, difficult to get, but uh, uh, it's getting restocked quickly. So I think everyone can get it. It's very fun. The problem, it is a bit short-lived. And that's basically my review. I, I, I love this game. I will keep this game, even if I have no one new to play it with. Uh, I will eventually play it with my kids, who are trying to crash, the, to crash land the plane all the time, basically. Right now, so I will wait for a couple of years. This game is beautiful in staying in my collection, but it could be a bit short-lived. I had a, a look through it and, uh, and played one quick game yesterday. 
one of the things that I thought is really, really interesting about the game is its physical aspect, because you have to uh, physically move tiny dials and yeah. um, place dials <laughs> on the board. And I love a board that is that has an aspect of physicality and and that a board that is playful. Yeah, uh, I think I'm... that the the game would be half as fun if you were just uh, filling out tiny little check boxes into a, onto a, a piece of paper or something. I think oh, that the game would lose a lot of its uh, fun. Yeah, you are physically flipping switches. Yeah, it's beautiful. And the, the 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 tilt of the plane is basically a transparent gear of. It's a transparent plane uh, that you actually tilt to match the tilt value, and it does a lot. Uh, the the I I think that it's pretty smart the work with the materials because they gave you basically a do-it-yourself double layer board. And I think that the costs are contained because it's a do-it-yourself. And it's pretty smart because it's easy and everyone does it. Yeah. Um, I also, when I played it, I couldn't help but remember um, another game that you brought up. Uh, that time you killed me. Another uh, beautiful two-player game. A really beautiful play- two-player game. <clears throat> it feels a bit like a um curb version of it because that time you killed me is also a game that kind of escalates the more you play it and and adds uh, little variables and tweaks to the already kind of confusing um way you play the game and uh sky team remind me did me of that i really like the the fact also that you cannot play during the game for a lot of board <laughs> games that's kind of hard to follow through sometimes it's a bit uh hard not to talk or do any expression uh, when playing a game but for sky team it's it's interesting because it leads to this very intense like few minutes of rolling dice and placing them down and then once everything is done you can be you can actually like talk to the other person and ask them what the fuck were you thinking yeah basically this is the best solution to the alpha player problem you basically have someone who has to shut up and just eat their liver when you do something. It's beautiful. And if you eventually uh, manage any way to land the plane, you see, see, it was not a problem after all. So it's beautiful. I I, I love this game. Uh, it's ve- very fun. I, I I like the comparison to the to that time you killed me. I I when uh, we review that uh, I just got to the modular game so maybe after years it could, it could be it could deserve this little spoiler after you finish all modules of that time you killed me you basically open another module which tells you to combine modules uh, basically randomly yeah and that's chaos that's beautiful <laughs> it is so, it adds a lot of variation to the game and uh allows you to keep playing it uh for a long time uh, actually, it is a game that I keep playing every time my friends from the university come visit. So it's not a lot uh, often, but every time when it happens, three times a year. So <laughs> it's still a lot for uh, to play a game. Uh, that time you killed me, I, I always want to play. Uh, it's maybe, a great game. Yeah, m- maybe the, the, the fact that uh, this possibly points the finger in the right direction because that time you killed me is a chess like game on three chess boards and that keeps the game fresh because basically your opponent can adapt and your mod you're playing against an opponent actually there's someone else who is tri- trying to play ai for you the co part is uh, what makes this game become a bit old once you completed it because once there are no new challenges basically uh, your copilot is uh, is an ai which is completely predictable because it's trying to help you that's it that's probably the the weak point uh, of the game so that that's a good finding about the switches, I have a veteran player recommendation. The switches are beautiful because you are flipping them, but they are cardboard switches on a double layer board. So if you put your game uh, vertically like me, 
on uh, uh, on a library or something uh, just remember to put the game uh, the, the 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 switches in a bag because uh, you won't find them so uh, th there is uh, there is another thing that you could do but you must do before assembling the do double layer board if you just add little flaps to the bottom of the switches uh, like plastic flaps or uh, uh, 0.2 millimeters cardboard uh, you can manage to have the switches stick to the to the cockpit while still being able to move and that's the perfect outcome i didn't do it in my copy but i do i did it in my brothers so uh, actually this is a do it yourself fix so if you want uh, maybe write us i will po possibly publish a guide or put it on discord if you are interested so <laughs> that's <laughs> it <laughs> and this is it sky team uh, buy it, get it, and uh, if you really do can't stand uh, to have an unplayed game for a lot of time after you completed it, resell it and uh, make it circulate because it's beautiful. All right, it's it does seem very very interesting. I I only played it uh, one time on on tabletop simulator, but I I'd grab this one because the physicality of it is is important. I feel. And you need to you need to have someone in front of you which exactly you the Luigi. You need to be there. able to get mad <laughs> yeah. at someone. Yeah, exactly. You have someone to get mad at you. All right. On my end, uh, I will talk about Pixel Tactics, which is a game published by Level Ninety Nine Games. Uh, the, it is the a ones from Bullet Heart. Uh, yes, it is a love letter to tactical JRPG uh, like Final Fantasy Tactics. Uh, and as a lot of the level 99 games, the base game costs about $25. It's very small uh, in size and in, in transportability. Uh, there is, however, four expansions. Each of them costs $15. So if you want the full connection, it's going to cost you uh, a lot more than the usual games. But the expansion simply adds more cards and units, uh, making it deeper. But it is not required to enjoy the game. Uh, the game sets two players against each other, uh, each with an identical deck of 25 cards. And from that deck, they'll choose a leader hero, then make an army of 3x3 three three cards and face the other player. Uh, whomever kills the other leaders uh, win. Each player has in front of them then a 3x3 three three grid slot in which they can place on cards. And the genius thing about this game is that each card that you have in your hand has five different hues. Um, each of them represents a somewhat stereotypical RPG class. So, for example, you have the fighter, the ranger, the knight, but you're also the necromancer. You have, uh, in one of the expansion, a golem. You have hunters. You have a bunch of really different uh, type of, of JRPG tropes and and classes they are jobs <laughs> exactly uh, each card can be uh, played uh, as a leader so if you face them upside down at the center of your grid then that card becomes your leader uh, written on the upside down side you have the leader stats uh, and his ability usually it's a more powerful uh, passive ability than the unit version um, so for example you can have um, the knight on the reserve si uh, side instead is called uh, Sir Sedenza. He has 20 life and the passive, uh, passive ability to decrease incoming damage by one for every other unit on your side. So it's a very powerful defensive <laughs> ability. But you could also have the fighter, which who is on the other side is called uh, Ikaru Soriyama. And I see it now. Yes. Uh, your hero has... Uh, uh, all of your units have plus three strength when making melee attack. So this is like a more offensive uh, leader. So the choice of your leader is going to really influence your tactics in the upcoming game. Uh, ca cards can also be played on the right side up, uh, in which case their ability will depend where they are put down. Because you have a grid of three by three, you have three lane. Uh, for example, keep using the knight as an example, he has 10 HP uh, on the unit side. And if you put it on the front line of the grid, his ability is to cause two damage back whenever he's attacked. If you put it on the middle side of the grid, 
it turns your leader immune to ranged damage. Um, so it's a mo much more defensive uh, ability. And on the back line, uh, it allows you to reassign any damage from any of your other units to him directly. So it's a, just a very strong uh, defensive ability. On the other hand, for example, if we take the, the fighter, uh, he has the ability to intercept, so he can black, block the ranged attack if he's on the front line. On the middle line, he has uh, plus two strength, and on the back lane, he has plus four strength. So you want to put him on the back, but then leave the two slots in front of him free to make more powerful attack, for example. Uh, this gives you a lot of different ways that you can play your units and incorporate them. Uh, but that only covers four of their, the cards used. There's a fifth use. Uh, because if you don't plan to put down your, your cards onto the game, uh, you can actually simply play them as a, a sort of a active card. Uh, so a one-time activation. For the knight, for example, it does four damage to every enemy unit uh, in melee. Uh, some heroes have traps or some heroes have boost for your other character or can heal. So if you don't plan on playing your unit, you can use it as a sort of um, one-time boost to the game. And that can quickly change how you approach things. Uh, sometimes you might uh, be forced to play one of the one card from your hand as a boost to help you out of a jam. Uh, while it would have been very useful if you were, were able to actually put it down a bit a battlefield later on. So, uh, you know, yeah. I, I, I just hearing your explanation while I'm looking at a card and I think I know how to play. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. very simple. If you just hear the explanation, look at your card, it's extremely easy to, to understand how things work. It's very well labeled and everything has this sort of um, pixel art, uh, art style which I think works really nicely for this game. Yeah. Um, so the way that the game is played is pretty easy. Each player draws a hand of five cards, selects one of them for the, to be the leader. Um, and from then on, the game starts playing. It is divided into rounds. Each round is, div is divided into three waves. And during each wave, both players will play two actions uh, onto a specific row of cards. So the first player starter, uh, so the first player is going to start each wave. And then at the end of the three wave, uh, you're going to switch who the first player is going to be. So each wave only affect, affects one row of cards, starting with the first row, then the middle row, then the back row. Um, and the, your two action can be spent to either draw cards, playing one on the battlefield, playing one as a activation, swapping or moving units. There's a couple of uh, a couple more actions that you can do, but you will need to read the, the game a um, little eight booklets to, to do that. Learning the game is very easy. It takes maybe 10 minutes at most. Um, oh, and one specific little rules that I mentioned earlier, if there's, if there's no unit in front of another unit, that unit is in melee and can attack the other player's melee unit. So some units are able to do ranged attack, which bypasses uh, other units, but you can try to have units protecting your more powerful but uh, more fragile units. It, uh, it gives a lot of um, tactical breath to the game. No? And it's very interesting to craft new strategies with different decks and different uh, hands that you're given or with a different leader. The game is always keeping itself fresh because of that, uh, which I find very interesting. That's basically the basic of it. The game is super easy to understand with well-written rules. It comes in small boxes holding the game cards, and each expansion had about uh, 25 different units uh, that will make the game more interesting once you have uh, you feel like you're done with the, the basic set of cards. Uh, it is a great game, super easy to pick up, very easy to teach, easy to carry around with a lot of depth. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an expensive one, it's not going to be a game that you'll play every week, but it's definitely a game that I've kept playing with new people every so often, because it kind of reminds me of um, uh, playing a game of magic, but without having to make super complicated decks with uh, spending a lot of time explaining the minutiae of certain rules or certain combos. This game feels like a more approachable uh, level of that for people that don't really want to get too much into the hobby. Uh, Pixel Tactics by level 99 games, uh, I would recommend it. 
very much so. That, that's beautiful. Actually, uh, I, I think I just missed how you win. Oh, uh, you killed the enemy's <laughs> leader. Uh, okay. The, the first unit that you put down at the center of your grid uh, is the leader. He has a bunch more HP than other units and that, uh, that strong uh, passive ability. But if you manage to, to kill the other player's leader, you win. Yeah, so you, you have to kill Icarus or Ayama. Yeah, okay. exactly. That's, that's right. Okay. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I was browsing for it because uh, I am my, my own worst enemy. So when uh, we talk about the game, I usually buy it. So <laughs> uh, I, I think that this would be right up your alley. Yeah, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, if I just uh, get to wait a little... Uh, it looks like on Steam there is something called Pixel Tactics Online from uh, uh, level 99 games. So possibly there's th there will be a Steam version soon? Yes, they are uh, currently planning to release a Steam version in 2024. Um, I think this could be a fun Steam game, but... Um, I'm not exactly sure why you would want to play... Uh, digital version of a board game version of this since the game is very much <laughs> meant to be played with someone else like it would be like playing uh, sky team with another with a uh, computer which you could do but you would probably lose a bit of the reason oh. why it's fun to play it okay i understood it was just to get it cheap so oh yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. well uh, well the the base game is uh, thankfully not too expensive okay uh, i i like uh, from the description, what I like about this game is the two dimensions of the 3x3 three three grid because you have lanes. And that's pretty smart because powers ca get, I, I can see that powers get pretty different. So uh, placing smart is probably the key of winning. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's very fun to see uh, a card and to try to figure out where it's going to be the most useful to you. To try to think, well... I would, I would discard if I put it in my first lane. It's going to be extremely strong and uh, allow me to do a lot of damage. But also, I could put it on my back lane and wait a couple of turns and use that to uh, directly attack the enemy's leader or something like that. Or trying to think about different ways that you can incorporate that and trying to also look at the other player's uh, grid and try to assess what's going to be the most dangerous to you, what you need to attack, and how you need to defend yourself. It is, it is quite fun. Okay, now if you tell me that you can draft units at the beginning, that there is a pick and counter pick, uh, I'm sold to this game. <laughs> uh, you can definitely do that if you, play, if you get more than the, um, the base game, yes. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll be down some money in the near future then. All right. Well, I'm glad that I managed to get you interested. Um, well... That's about all the time that we have for this small, uh, short two-player episode. But you can catch uh, actually, us over. Actually, it, it, oh. it took a lot. It, no, I, I, I think it took a lot for being just a two-player, a two two-game, two two-people episode. So. <laughs> yeah, but uh, both games are, are quite fun. So uh, sometimes yeah. those are great to recommend too. Uh, and also, since we are recommending two player games, I'm also going to uh, recommend uh, That Time You Killed Me, because even though we talked about it earlier uh, into another episode, it is still a great game. So you should, yeah, you should have a look at that one. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, that's about all the time that we have for this episode. You can catch us over at patreon.com slash the last ND with two E. And um, that said, until next time, we have been the last ND. It's going to be a good bar from Alessio. Not from an Avan, goodbye. And from myself, but remember that the second E in Standy stands for Emergency Landing. Mm -hmm.